I am Janessa. I'm the nurse practitioner. nurse practitioners for the pediatric pain service here at Randall. Um, some quick things to just go over. This is a part of the UHCM the pain and types of code. Um, this conference for nurses, you can get CME credits, so just make sure that you get that paperwork from Susan in the back. Fill out the form and she will give you your CME paperwork so you have that. Um, and I think their schedule for the week, if you want to get that, so that you know what's going on for the next two days after today. So presenting about the do's and don'ts of opioid prescribing. The other one I'm going to be discussing are the opioid epidemic that we're currently in. Um, go to the legislation that Ohio passed regarding opioid prescribing or um, the pharmacology is and then a quick education about you're going to use a tip, which is something that Rainbow is going to start using more frequently for your folks. And talk about some definitions um, just so that we understand the differences between all of these. So, tolerance is when um, I look at as um, when a patient gets used to having a medication especially an opioid, for example. So a patient's been on an opioid for a prolonged period of time, and that same dose isn't working as well, you'll notice that a patient needs more because they've been that medication so long, so they've developed a tolerance. The is the physiological and biochemical adaptation of your neurons that your body gets used to having that medication around. It means that you, um, it's not, it's just that your body, is used to have there, and if you take medication away, they will withdraw. Um, and withdrawal is the actual clinical symptoms you see when a patient has dependence and you take that medication away. Um, withdrawal and opioids is usually GI side effects, so you will see not vomiting and diarrhea, for example. And benzos, it's more of neuro um, symptoms, so irritability, tremors, those kinds of things. What I example for tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal is you can think of, since I'm from Rainbow, patients that are in the NICU or the NICU who are intubated and sedated with fentanyl and versa drips for a prolonged period of time. They develop a uh, tolerance, so they end up having to go up and up on those drips to make sure that that patient stays comfortable. Um, if they're not typically for five days, you have about a 50% chance. Seven days, you're pretty much, you have pretty more or less 100% chance of withdrawal, so you develop a dependence with that. There's addiction, which addiction, you can see withdrawal, you can see dependence, you can see tolerance, but you do not necessarily see addiction if you have tolerance, dependence, or withdrawal. So it is the psychological dependence and craving of a drug. So you psychologically want and need this drug, and you go out and seek it, and may do things that aren't out of judgment to try and get that medication. So you may go through your friends or your cover, someone's house, to see if they have extra opioid prescriptions sitting around in their house or selling things so that you can go and um, purchase the drug that you want to have. So the opioid epidemic. So there's um, these statistics. People start opioid pain relievers annually. Um, healthcare have written 259 million opioid prescriptions in 2012. There's a statement that I read of where it says that I believe it was in 2015, there were enough opioids prescribed and written for that each adult American could have a bottle of um, opioid prescriptions, which is pretty impressive. Tenable report using opioids non-medically. In addition to that, estimated range that 150 to 175 Americans die as a result of opioids. And the number of in 2015 was more than 33,000, which rose in 2017 
to more than 72,000. If you look at printing, 11% of high school seniors report they were using opioids for non-medical use, and they mainly from leftovers that were sitting around at people's homes. A um, study that shows that of the opioid prescriptions that most people are prescribing, about 58% that are left over um, that people don't use, which is a decent amount. And even families are informed, patients are informed of how to dispose of leftover opioids, only 4% of them actually do it appropriately. And then this is of updates, obviously, which shows opioid deaths in 2015. And this includes fentanyl, um, prescription aids, and heroin overdoses. So get that, that the states are obviously have the higher um, deaths from opioids, and the states have less. If you're going to be taking that into consideration, blue states are a good place to go. Opioid epidemic in the U.S. in 2015, again, some more statistics, but 12.5 million people misused prescription opioids, a million people had prescription opioid use disorders, and 78.5 billion in the economic costs from the 2013 data. In October of 2017, the White House declared that the opioid epidemic was a national public health emergency. Um, opioid epidemic look like. In 2015, 3,000, um, there were 3,000 overdose deaths. There were about 200 um, overdose in 14, so that went up from 14 to 15. 85 percent of overdoses involved opioids, and 30 percent involved fentanyl. So, uh, then the o governor came up with the um, Ohio Opioid Action Team. Um, it's combating the drug abuse that we are seeing in Ohio. And it uses many initiatives. Some of them include Start Talking, which I had, I mean, I didn't know about until I started working on this. Um, where parents can go on to the Start Talking website and they can find what resources there are for um, teenagers who may have drug abuse issues. Um, there's video of parents or who lost teenagers or young adults of here are the symptoms that we should have seen or and wish we would have seen in the past before this happened to know what the drug abuse issue as well as some resources for families. Also the project Dawn which makes it so that Narcan is much easier to access for patients. Um, they can go into a pharmacy and get that. It also is a moment when pharmacists can say you know, here are some information on um, a treatment or things, and just an education moment about how you can get some help for your opioid addiction if you have one. This is a thing that shows how Ohio has done 2000 to 2017, um, just the different initiatives that they've had. So the opioid legislation. Um, to affect December of 2017. The key point you need to first consider non opioid treatment options. So, if this is for mild pain, using Tylenol or an NSAID, using non pharmacological management, um, for minimum opioid quantity and potency. So, what they can prescribe for three days or less, and that seems appropriate, prescribe three days or less. Um, going to how much that there are 58% of prescriptions left over, making sure that that we're just to do what we're prescribing for. Limit all prescri prescriptions for acute pain of minors to five days, and it's seven days for an adult. Prohibiting ex extended release opioids for acute pain. Require patients to be advised of the benefits and risks of using an opioid or a controlled substance. And limit morphine equivalent dose to 30 MEDs per day. So go specifically. All prescription limits. So again, you can prescribe for minors for five days and seven days for adults. That doesn't mean you can't, as a provider, decide five days, seven days isn't enough. Um, the example I will use is when I care of kids who have spinal fusions or pectus repairs, or big surgeries, and they're painful. I prescribe them for seven days when they go home, um, and I have to do that. 
what we have to do is in your notes, you have to document somewhere. Of, I am writing for more than the five days or seven days, and this is why I believe that it's appropriate or deemed that this needs to happen. I find that if you do write for more than those recommended time periods, the medical board or nursing board can also come and um, view what you're doing. So just keeping that in mind too. Between immediate and long acting, I'm sure everyone in this room has an idea about this. Um, immediate is the shorter acting. So it's going to be an interval every four to six hours. Um, you're going to use it for acute pain. Long is typically more of the twice a day schedule. And you're going to use more of like cancer pain. Um, another one that I've seen is patients who have severe Y and they constantly are breaking their bones, so they need long-acting prescriptions too. So prescribed minors, you do need to have an informed consent that you have on file. Um, this went into effect September of 2014. Um, components that need to be in this consent is that you're assessing their mental health and substance abuse history, risks and dangers of a controlled substance, and then just obtaining a signature from parents or guardians. I strongly encourage that when you are writing a prescription for a controlled substance, that you um, either make a statement saying that you have this consent complete and in, at, within your documents and charts, or you send a copy with them with a prescription. So the people that need consent forms, or it has any pediatric patient that had a medical emergency, if this prescription is related to surgery, it covers um, personal judgment is that if they were to do this, it would detriment the minor's health or safety. The example I can think of, and it would be my personal opinion, it would be if you have parents who come in and are very opposed to giving opioids, and there's a big opioid epidemic, and I don't want my kids to have um, it's totally understandable. But it's cold judgment that they just had a huge surgery or they have whatever medical illness going on and they do need an opioid to help improve their pain um, and improve it so that they can heal. In that case, that might be an example of where you don't need to do that off of what your um, you know, beliefs, thoughts, and your judgment is from that. So I guess it would be more judgment than personal beliefs. And then what about the exams if you were in the hospital, emergency facility, ambulatory surgery, or respite care, or doing any compound prescriptions? Um, have a controlled substance in it. And this is um, what the Art Talking Consent Form looks like. Um, it is available on the internet. If you can, um, somewhere on there. And morphine equivalent dose. Um, higher doses of opioids that we are prescribing, there's a higher risk of overdose and death. So just to bring two examples, I own 20 milligrams per day is equal to three morphine equivalent doses. Um, Oxy, five milligrams, Q6. Take it in 30 milligrams a day, or Dilaudid, 7.5 milligrams a day is equal to the mor 30 morphine equivalent doses. So it, that um, we're all stuck there, and all you can ever prescribe for patients is Oxy, five milligrams, Q6. Because there's patients out there that you have the 75 kilo patient who just had surgery, and I'm giving them 10 milligrams of oxycodone. It does, don't send them home with that. You still, you just, again, need to document in your chart, what am I giving more than what's recommended in this legislation? Who is exempt opioid limits? Um, hospice patients, palliative care patients, ter patients with term conditions, cancer patients, if you're prescribing for detox or inpatient prescriptions. I know our care service will actually write on the prescription palliative care patient so that people know when they aren't questioning things about about that. So um, it was also with this legislation, they wanted to have certain things that are in within the prescription. So have the number of days written out. So you need to have the dispensed amount. You need an ICD-10 code written on the prescription. Um, it always strongly encouraged, but not mandatory. And I'm not going to lie, I always forget to do this. Um, it needs to have an it's encouraged statement that says, this patient is exempt from an opioid consent form for minors, or you have a consent form on file in their, their chart. So just that in mind. Um, but if you are outside of the hospital, then you should be doing the opioid consent form like we talked about. 
keep the EMR and you're writing a prescription, um, you can either do the pharmacy part right here and write your own thing. So you can write dispensed for five days, that post spinal fusion, ICD-10 code is this. Um, you don't have to say write dispensed. You can always go to where it says days right here. And you can say for five days, show days in SIG, and then it will say oxyco 5 milligrams Q6 times five days. I'm anal, and I don't like that. So pharmacy memo notes. My own issue. You don't have to do what I do. Um, you can also go to the ICD-10 and go here to the problem list, and you pick out which problem you're prescribing this prescription for, and then that will come up with your ICD-10. So then you're prescribed like this. There's the pharmacy memo right here. Uh, with whatever you write, whatever, or you can just do the diagnosis code goes up right here. Either line, the information just needs to be on the prescription. If you all look, this one it says uh, one tablet every six hours times three days. So whatever you want to do it, just making sure that the information is there. So most, if not everybody, should know what an ORS account is. Um, or it was established in 2006, and it's a way for um, anyone to look and see what prescriptions were written and where were they um, first filled. Used um, prior to prescribing any controlled substance, um, you should it once every 90 days. Anytime you red flags, that makes you concerned. Um, and the practice is to run an ORS report at every office visit. Something that I really learned about, so I don't know if anyone else in here, maybe you guys all already know this, but gabapentin is going to be added to the ORS report soon. The reason being is that um, gabapentin is starting to be abused more, which, again, I was news to me. Um, it's gabapentin, and I live in my own little naive bubble, and I'm aware of that, but um, gabapentin is a non-opioid medication that we all know, and on the street it's known as Johnny's or Gabby's. And it is the euphoric effects of heroin, and when taken in high doses, it can produce marijuana-like highs. So that's why that is becoming um, added to the ORS account. The um, is that if they're frequently requesting refills for opioids of benzos, they're losing their prescription. Another example that I've been given when I've gone to um, presentations is we'll say, yeah, the patient will call and be like, so I have my prescription bottle over the toilet, and then it fell into the toilet, so I need more. I'm not really sure why we're holding prescription bottles over the toilet, but the examples that people will give. Um, um, reading scheduled medications from multiple prescribers, visiting EDs, urgent cares, and walk-in clinics if they have a history of drug abuse. Um, and if reports need to be occur in minors, the answer is yes. A prescription and then annually. Um, and then just make have a consent from the parents. Who we don't do a mandatory check on in ORS um, is anyone in hospice or has a terminal illness. If you're prescribing for seven days or less, if you have other conditions, um, if it's while you're in the hospital or after surgery or related to surgery. Um, I do think, though, my understanding is that UH wants us all to be writing, doing reports, running ORS reports on any patients that um, in the start writing for sub controlled substances for. How you register for ORS if you have not already done it. You can do it all online. When I originally did this, I actually had to do a paper and get a notary and all that fun stuff. You don't have that. You just go onto the website, register, and it takes about 10 minutes. So how do you do ORS? Um, the one I'm about, because well, excites me, is that you can actually go to the ORS tab up top. If you just click on that, it will actually log you into ORS, give you that specific patient ORS information. Or you can actually just go in and log in. If you EMR, though, you can't get anything other than your patient information. So there are things you can get through ORS that you can't get if you go through EMR. You have to actually go to the ORS website. Looks like um, it gives you the overdose overdose risk score, and then it also shows you where did the, um, when was the patient prescribed written medication or when did they fill it, what was it, how many tablets or how much suspension did they give, um, these, who prescribed it in the pharmacy, and down lower it also gives you information about providers and pharmacies.
there is your score. The lower it is, the less likely you're going to have an overdose death. The higher it is, the more likely. So just keeping that in mind. Um, it does give you variables that are written there. The risk score that is greater than 450, the state actually requires that we start writing them for naloxone in addition to their controlled substance. So keeping that in mind too. So if you go on to this and they're 450 or greater, then you have a rate for Narcan in addition. There is educational resources available on the ORM website that you can use. Um, there's quite a few. There isn't really new about, so maybe you guys don't. There's my which actually makes it that you can look up your own personal prescribing um, and see how my prescribing, how much do I prescribe for, am I prescribing for too much or for too little. Um, the thing that I found out though is if you have a hospital DEA number like I do, you're going to pull all of the prescriptions that have been written with a hospital DEA number, so it's not helpful for those personal people. But if you own DEA number, you can use it. You type that in, it gives you information of prescriptions am I writing for, what's the drug, how much, and then you can kind of just evaluate, am I writing for too much, or just looking to see what are your prescription practices. So um, when I was doing all of this, um, originally I was looking it up, I, at the opioid epidemic and the statistics and all of that, I'm not going to lie, I was kind of like, okay, well, I'm writing for prescriptions for opioids, I'm going to do something else, and then kind of, well, if I do that, A, I'm going to have to find a new job, and the trick um, is an opioid epidemic, and um, there is that issue, but there's also the concern that pediatric patients still are not treated well um, related to pain. So it's been shown that children are often not recognized when they're in pain, and they're ineffectively managed. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with fear, and I've heard it from fellows who spend time with us. I've heard it from residents of where I have like, yeah, but I don't be the one that was responsible for causing the pediatric patient to stop breathing, so I'm just going to underdose them. Or, you know, just stay with me so that we can make sure that I'm doing the right thing because I don't want to mess up on this patient. Um, not that people don't care about the adults and stop them from breathing. I think that with kids, there's just that illness that it's the kids. Um, um, I fear that children will become addicted. Um, I think that's probably more family than providers. There are some providers out there that are also fearful of it, but that's always that fear too. There have been many studies that it shows that children's pain is under-assessed and under-treated. This actually came from emergency rooms and it's adult emergency rooms of where they were like, let's see how we do with pain control and pain management. And they realized they really didn't do a good job at all. And then for some reason, the PGDs were like, what how could we do if the adults are not doing a great job? And we found that we did even worse of a job. So making sure that we're, um, remember that we do need to treat children and their pain. And if we don't treat people then pain, they um, aren't going to heal as quickly. They're going to have a lot of side effects. There's a lot of negativeness that can happen with that. So recommend for prescribing, using a multimodal approach. You want to use um, non-opioids. So Tylenol will increase your opioid need by about 20%. Um, Tylenol works in your CNS, we don't know exactly how, um, and it's created through your liver, which we all know. And then NSAIDs, um, there's some literature that sh says that it's more severe analgesic over Tylenol, those that say it's probably not true. Um, and then NSAIDs at the site where you have pain and inflammation and it's created through your kidney. The reason I'm telling both of those things is that I I know in nursing, and I'm learning in medical school, that we're all taught you have to do this whole alternating thing. You can't give Tylenol and an NSAID together. Um, I'm not really sure why. The more I think about it and the more I learn about pain management, for pain management, you can give Tylenol and an NSAID together at the same time, dosing. So Tylenol of 15 mg per kg, Motrin at 10 mg per kg, give them every six hours together. Um, the reasoning being, pharmacologically, it's not like it. If you get together at three hours, they suddenly have an increase in pain. They don't. That keeps lasting for about six hours. So yeah, around five and a half, six hours, they start having pain. Um, it's also easier if you think about, about it, especially in the hospital. You have a nurse coming in every two or three hours going, hey, wake up. It's time to take your pain medication. So for related reasons, you can give Tylenol and an NSAID together. 
at home, um, looking from a pediatric standpoint, if you're a parent and it's 3 p.m. or even 3 p.m. you're exhausted and your child is in pain and you're sitting there going, what did I just give my kid three hours ago? I don't remember. And what am I supposed to get from now? So if you together, you solve both of those problems and it improves your pain control. Light is also something you use, like lidoderm patches. I and mean, you can also use topical creams like capsaicin. You can also use regional anesthesia if you're in the hospital and using epidurals and blocks, which should decrease your opioid need altogether, um, non-pharmacological management. So here, um, I know that Carrie and I will find that when we go into a patient's room when they're really, really upset, if we just start talking to them and figure out what they're actually interested in, that helps distract them and it calms them down. Um, and it's a really simple thing. It takes a few minutes to figure out what they want to talk about, but it works. Hip patient, acupuncture and acupressure, Massage, aromatherapy, physical therapy, and psychological therapy. So, the World Health Organization. Um, the, I'm about the World Health Organization pain guidelines. Um, we came out in 1986 and was revised in 2012. And with that, there's a pain ladder. In 1986, there was actually three steps. So it was mild pain, moderate, and severe pain. And three steps. In 2012, we changed it to two steps where you have mine for the first step and second step, they combined mild and severe pain. So mild, um, you have your non-opioids, so you're using your NSAID and your Tylenol. For pain, you use straw opioids. They recommend morphine. You could use oxycodone. You can use the lot. Uh, but it's that you're using a lower dose for moderate pain and a higher dose for severe pain. Um, they recommend that if you have consistent pain, we need to be scheduled with their pain medication, not giving them PRN pain medication. Um, when we do PRN pain medication for a kid who has consistent or an adult who has consistent pain, um, what we're doing is we're waiting for that patient to actually wait until they're in severe pain. And studies have shown they wait until they're about 7 to 8 out of 10 before they actually ask for pain medication. Then they call us, who sometimes takes a little while to get in there. She has to draw it up and deliver. So that can all take a while. I've had patients who said, I pressed that button and it took an hour for me to actually get the pain medication. And my pain was bad when I pressed the button. It was even worse when I actually got the pain medication and now we're playing a whole, whole catch-up game. Uh, that's why PRN isn't the most ideal if you're in that acute, consistent pain. Um, they also say that we should be using oral as a route that we're using. The reason oral pain medications work really well, I think sometimes there's a thought process that IV is way better than oral. It's not. I works faster, so I give it to you. You can feel the effect within 15 minutes, if not sooner than that. Or it'll take about 30 minutes. So if you have acute severe pain, IV is definitely to go. If there's severe pain and you got what's going on, then IV PCA totally makes sense. But when you figure out where they're at with what they need for pain medication and they're tolerating um, food, there's no reason to go to oral pain medication. Um, it doesn't mean that I go from a PCA or IV to oral and I'm taking a step that I'm not if you that appropriately, it's going to be the same exact dose. So it's not a step down. Um, also have patients who will say, I'm of different ages or parents of younger kids who will tell me that they actually are doing better with the oral pain medication and feel better on it than they did with an IV or PCA. So just keep it in mind too is the University Hospital's Opioid Prescribing Guidelines of 2018, which will be found on the UH Controlled Substance Toolkit, which is on the internet. Um, and that toolkit, the website for that, has all kinds of information about opioids. So just keeping that in mind. These are broken up into, if they're in an ED or acute facility, um, emergency room, post-surgical pain, chronic and palliative care pain, and then hospital. And then what are the specific calls, the proceeding limitation, the ORS requirements, and then important clinical steps. So it breaks it down of what you need to be looking at when you're prescribing opioids for these patients. And it's going off of this, since I do a lot of post-op pain. So for surgical pain, your goal is to prevent long-term opioid dependence. Your prescriptions are to supply for the only number of pills believed to be necessary. And then co-prescribing of benzodiazepines. Um, which I think makes sense, but sometimes that's hard, especially if you have a large orthopedic surgery. You is make sure we're spacing out the benzos and the opioids when you're at home so that you're not getting too sleepy. Or um, 
that's required by law. However, providers should check or if there's a reason to believe that the patient may be abusing, diverting. And then in, in clinical steps, um, the risk for addiction or abuse or diverting and use you know, red flags, avoid high volume, short acting gen doses. If pain is beyond the expected duration, um, evaluate and refer and consider a controlled substance agreement when duration of opioids is greater than 30 days. Um, Frederick Strickstorff, which is um, he is um, a pain physician in Minnesota for the Children's Hospital there, who had a robust acute and chronic pain um, clinic there. So keeping that in mind, but um, there is, if you have no if patients have no clinical signs or acute tissue injury, and pain can take beyond the expected time of healing, then in fact we have that opioids are not beneficial. In all circumstances, will we prescribe morphine or other opioids? So just keeping that in mind too, when you are seeing a patient. Um, and for primary pain disorders like headache, central um, pain, muscular skeletal, they like try and get their patients back to normal life as soon as possible, and they use things like physical therapy, exercise, hypnosis, psychotherapy, and massage. So we have this sheet um, we use for the pediatric pain service. Um, we have a whole packet when we discharge patients, and it has information about um, pain medication and constipation. And then there's this um, safety information, which goes over what opioids, what's the side effects, um, and then what do I need to know about it. So just keeping it in a secure place, maybe counting pills if there, to see if there's any missing. Um, and once you're done disposing and putting using that uh, using disposal boxes. There is a website on here, and I know there's a lot of different websites. Um, this one, put in your address, and it will show you all of the um, disposal boxes that are near your house, which I find pretty interesting. Are there any questions about the prescription? So just real going over JTIP. Um, current Rainbow, we use JTIP, and there's restrictions on its use. Um, and for those that don't know, JTIP is a needle-free injection delivery system. So it's that needle, it uses pressurized gas, and it pushes buffered lidocaine into your sub-Q space to help numb the area for pokes. Um, towards the end of October, we lift all those restrictions, and we can use JTIP on any patient, anytime, as long as they're over the age of one. Um, and we're going to have them available on the floors, um, and then continuing where they're at. We do it for stat pokes or planned pokes. Um, I'm going to have it added to our admission order set, so that's probably not going to happen until December or February ish. Um, so it's easier for everyone to get that. So there, there is a rep that will be coming um, the week before that to just come and do some hands on education too. Are there any questions about any of information? That's all I have for you, so thank you. Thank you.